All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of The Conversation. Um, we're back here today again to uh, continue the conversation um, like we have always done. And um, obviously, uh, I believe everybody that has listened to this video is now understand what our goal here is. It's a simple conversation with ordinary Gambians to talk about current issues, uh, the way forward, and most importantly, the election um, season that is up on us right now, the presidential election. We want to talk to Gambians to hopefully speak to our uh, political um, um, leaders, especially the opposition, and maybe even the government. Hopefully, everybody that's listening will learn something here, understand that we're just not ordinary Gambians out there, loose cannons, just um, against the government, but we're responsible citizens that care about our nation. And uh, here we are talking about the way forward. Um, this uh, morning, we do have a fine young man from the UK, uh, Mr. Suleiman Jeng is with us. Suleiman, welcome to the conversation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kruvali. It's an honor for me to be on the conversation. Thank you. And uh, just a little disclaimer here, Suleiman is obviously from the same town like me. Um, our families are very close. We know each other very well, but needless, um, he does have a role and responsibility in this movement. Um, Suleiman is also an editor-in-chief for the Kibaro Radio, um, an avid writer of um, political um, issues um, on the Gambia. Suleiman, I know you very well, but to the benefit of our listeners, I would like you to take a quick moment to just introduce yourself to somebody, that person that have not met Suleiman before. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kruvali, for the opportunity. Um, like you stated, we all hail from Basse, and the families are close. But uh, Suleiman Jeng, often referred to as Sol Jeng, grew up in Basse, went to Nasir High School, then Gambia College, where I did my HTC. I taught for several years at uh, Brikama Secondary School on the Alpha Khan. Before I proceeded to the uh, university extension program where I did my bachelor's uh, and then proceeded to the police. I joined as a kid at ASP, trained for one year, then joined the police. So I had an opportunity to work on the several departments as a police officer, and I also had the opportunity to work with the PIU, uh, providing a lot of back of protection for President Jami, especially during the 2001 presidential election. I had the opportunity to work with him and Usain Udawa as well very closely. But before that, I was exposed to politics uh, well in my early high school days around 86. Then Ibrahim Abba, who was, you know, a mate of my elder brother, used to ride against the then headmaster that is uh, St. George's Secondary School. And normally he would bring these things and then I would rewrite it for him because I used to have very good handwriting and then he would post it. So it still some lot of reaction at the secondary school because there was this um, Swedish and uh, St. George's Secondary School exchange visit and the school used to have a lot of things so he was exposing it and then I went to join the uh, anti-apartheid movement on the, the then Joru Kuruwari and uh, Wee Sanyang so it exposed me to like I said a lot of political opinions and Swai Buture of Doi also had been giving me a lot of Fourier papers and through those I gain a lot of political consciousness. That's all about me in a nutshell. Wow, that is so great. Uh, it's always good to know how many of us that are in this struggle um, really got started. And it's, it's good to know that you obviously uh, were influenced by um, some, some of these good people that you just mentioned here. Something as ordinary as, um, you know, in high school, obviously exposing the fact that the First Republic probably wasn't as bad as uh, many make it look like right now, because at least at that point, people were able to write stuff and challenge um, um, some of our leaders in our community. But Suleiman, you talked about being in the PIU and uh, participating in the 2001 presidential election. You worked with um, Jame and also with Dabo. Can you expand on that a little bit? What, what did you exactly do during that time as a PIU? Well, uh, during the presidential election in 2001, we had two platoons. 
uh, of 32 men and women, we were armed and given uh, gas masks. Then myself and my colleague, uh, normally when President Jame is traveling, we would travel with him. So one team would stay as a backup and the other team would be advanced. For example, if I am on advance, I would go with my platoon to the next meeting village and then, you know, assign them to various uh, posts and also investigate and check if there is any security threat, then we will liaise with the army or the NIA. But if, it is, if there is no threat, we just carry on our normal uh, duties as security officers. We also try to prevent any other, you know, riot or any demonstration. So if we had a back, if we had a backup we have to wait until you know the president settles then we will come down and ensure you know everything is secured until when he leaves and the whole convoy leaves then we will stay at last and then wait for them to go. Then we'll go to the next uh, meeting. Okay. Um, you said obviously um, you, 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 you do have these um, two groups that will advance and also the backup. At any point during that time, I mean, when we see um, Yaya travel right now in the country, there's just his arm to the teeth. And uh, I mean, obviously that all cost a lot of money, national resources. Has there been any time um, during this time in 2001 where there were, you, you guys discovered any type of threat for the, for the president? Um, was this necessary? I, mean, I know this is normal protocol, but was there a time that you guys discovered any threat that you can share with us? Not at any point did we detect any threat for the president. But with the UDP, when I was assigned um, to find and follow them, I wasn't given any information as to what my role and responsibility was with the UDP. Because uh, what happened is when we came to Mansa Congo with the president, uh, my operation commander at the time, Ibrahim Akamara, uh, Commissioner Kamara, you know, phoned and told me that, well, we've got information that all the other opposition parties are converging in Basse, and there is a likelihood uh, a riot might erupt. So you have to go back with your platoon to support, you know, the Basse police. So I went with that notion, but upon arrival in Basse, I was instructed to find out where Dabo was. So I did, you know, because <laughs> as you know, I'm from Basse, so I know the inside out of Basse, like my, you know, the back of my hand. So I was able to locate him at Usenu, at um, MC Cham's compound. And when I reported back, well, uh, the UDP, uh, Posted at MC Cham's compound, I was told to follow them. But follow them for what reason? I didn't know. So I had to use my discretion and said, well, since we've provided uh, protection for His Excellency, I'm going to do the same for UDP. But at first, they didn't trust uh, me, particularly being a police officer, even though I was a native of Basse and most of my people were in the opposition at the time. So it took me a while to gain their trust. And once that was done, when we came to Karantaba, I think before Baba Job's village, there was a meeting before, and then someone came and, you know, gave us an information that the late Baba Job was planning an ambush on lawyer Dabo uh, because he was attacked at Denton Brick by the UDP supporters, so he was going to retaliate. So when I got that information, I had to rush quickly while Dabo was on a meeting. I went and spoke to the late uh, Baba Job. I told him, look, I understand this is uh, what is, you know, in the pipeline. But my responsibility is to protect Dabo and his entourage. So I'm not going to stand by and let anyone, you know, uh, attack him. If that happens, then, you know, definitely there will be blood spilled. So I wouldn't want that. So the best thing is you let go because he attacked you in Banjul. You wait until when Davo gets to Banjul, if you want to do whatever you want to do with him, then that's not my responsibility. But for now, he is my responsibility. I'm going to make sure I execute that. So he understood and said, okay, now if his convoy is passing, I let all my boys come in and organize a football, which they did. And then we pass freely. 
But unfortunately, uh, the following day, when we were coming from Pakalinding, going to Medina, somewhere after Jara Soma, you know, when you come in, there is a filling station just by the Johnson. So as the UDP convoy was coming out, you know, there was this um, APRC van, and then this driver just drove through the convoy, and accidentally, I think he hit OJ's vehicle, and that sparked up a big, big reaction from the UDP militants. But thank God I was, we were able to handle it. Nobody was actually seriously injured, but there were some damages to some properties. So I've identified few people that were actually involved in doing some other stuff. So some of them were part of the APRC, others were part of the UDP. And I spoke to Dabo, I said, well, I've seen X and Y doing this, and I understand he or she is within your convoy. So I have taken their details and I've reported back to my operation commander probably they may or may not be called in for questioning, but if they do, uh, this is the circumstances, it's X and Y. And then when I reported back to <coughs> my operation commander, it didn't went down well with him at the time because they expected me to effect arrest at the moment. I said I could not have effected arrest or ordered for an arrest to be effected because if I had done that, it would have sparked things from the firing pan to the fire so i had to let go everything to subside and then you know take these details and then give it to uh, the head office at the end of the day they can instruct officers to go and arrest them on the ground thank you uh Suleiman, for that that is definitely uh, very good information here now as someone who, who obviously had worked with the regime back then and this information that you've given us obviously is, is very important um, at any point when you worked um, as the, um, with the forces, could you share with us, has, has there been any plans that you know of or can share with us which were directly uh, directed towards the opposition in sabotaging them and ensuring that they, they, they did not campaign effectively or, or have a, a peaceful rallies in the nation? At the time, to be quite honest, uh, in the, while I was in the police, I've never experienced uh, instances where they would say go and arrest Y or go and arrest Z. Because whenever there is an order to arrest someone, there must be a genuine reason to execute it. Uh, at some point, like I said, after the incident, I think I was punished by my superiors. So I was the first ASV that was head of the registry. There was no officer commanding that was head of the registry at the time. So I was deployed back to the registry. And the registry is where in this latest that uh, communication between the IG and uh, outsiders, especially uh, like uh, issuing of permits. So when the permits came, it's like, um, I would tell IG that X and Y applied for permits. And normally he would say, just, you know, endorse it. And then I would endorse it. So it came and saying, normally comes to my office. MC Charm used to come to my office because they're family anyway. So when they come in at, at one point, I was advised, look, most of these people are in the opposition and you know, you are a young officer. You should not encourage them coming to your office. I said, well, I am a public officer, so I cannot choose who should come to see me or who is not to come to see me. As long as they come in on official matters, they cannot come to my house. They have to come to my office. So the UDP, when they applied, came saying, I think I've issued him two uh, permits, if I remember very well. But after the change said, now you cannot issue political uh, rallies permits, it has to be given by the IG's office directly. Then Ibunja was the Inspector General of Police at the time. And JSO was the DIG at the time. Thank you so much, Suleiman. Now, you said that you obviously, you know, um, once they started suspecting that you were not as brutal as they wanted you to be, they deployed you um, to obviously, you know, office duties where you were issuing permits. To the average government that is listening, 
Can you explain to us what the process is like when a political party, especially, is trying to apply for permit? Walk us through that process. Well, normally, the person, uh, the whether it's a political party or it's an organization, if you are organizing, you know, then we used to have these sponsored walls, we used to have these furals, we used to have this Zimba thing. You have to put it in writing and apply and state where you want to hold it and then what times, whether you'll be using public addressing system or not. Is it a, is, is it a form or just a letter that you write? Is there a form that you fill in or is, is it just a letter that you write? And is there a fee attached to this? Yeah, you have to. No, there was no fee attached to it. There was no payment. I'm not sure if there is now, but then there was no payment at all. You just have to write and apply. And then, you know, we will write back to say, yes, you have been granted, you know, permit to hold it. But you are also responsible for anything that happens during that period of time. For example, if any crime is committed during that period, you will be wholly responsible. So that will be indicated on the permit as well. So when, when they bring in the permits to you, what is normally the turnaround time? And you said at, at one point uh, they, they, they took the political uh, rally permits out of your uh, jurisdiction and moved it up. Um, did, did you have any information what happened uh, after that, how they were approved and, you know, what the approval uh, ratings, I mean, rates were? Well, if you could do it within a day because to be quite honest with you, Mr. Kruberly, uh, at the headquarters, there isn't that loads of work that will hold you for days. You can finish your, you know, office uses. Maybe you'll have two or three files to, to look at, either to approve or to disapprove. And then that wouldn't take you five, ten minutes to do. So with the with the um, permits, all you have to do is to, to approve it and then give it to the secretary who would type a formal you know standard letter to say yes you've been you know granted permit and then you can hold it and then you'll be responsible for it so there wasn't that strenuous or a very rigorous standard or procedure that you would follow it's just to look at it approve it or say no because for some reasons let's say if i allow it let's say at the uh Round uh, of the turn table is going to affect traffic. So I'm not going to uh, grant it based on the fact that it's going to affect traffic and then that could cause a lot of, uh, it will cause a lot of wastage of time and resources. So you have to put all those things into consideration and what risks are involved when it is held at a particular place. But once those things are put into consideration and you realize, well, it's not going to cause any harm to anybody, it's not going to cause harm to any property, it's not going to affect traffic in any way, then you can let it go. For example, with uh, sponsored works, when schools or organizations like the Red Cross or our scheme want to have a sponsored work on the Serekunda Banjul Highway, sometimes we assign police officers because they have to stop the traffic. And some drivers, you know, might not be, you know, might, wouldn't like being stopped because they'll be in the rush time trying to get, you know, customers to make money. But some of them understand and they'll give you a pound here and there or a penny here and there. So with the police, sometimes it goes smoothly. But without that one, sometimes it could result into an accident. Like, you know, a driver speeding might hit a participant and that could come back to the police. So we have to look into all those things. But with the political one, it's completely different. I've never seen at any point in time while I was there when the APRC applied for a permit. So, so that they, one, they actually never applied for a permit. They just had rallies as they wished. But the opposition was required to apply for a permit. Well, the opposition, everyone is required to apply for a permit. Even the APRC, by law, they require to apply for a permit before they can hold a political rally. But they for never example, do. Yeah, for example, during the uh, 2001 election, you know, the IEC had to give them uh, this campaign program. For example, they will say, APRC, you have to campaign in uh, Badibu. Uh, Doi, you have to campaign in Fuladu. Uh, NRP, you have to uh, campaign in Combo, so that the parties wouldn't collide at one place or they wouldn't converge at one place. So each, even if they are to meet at one particular um, constituency, they would have different times where they would meet. 
So if you don't adhere to those times, it would lead to some problem. So when it comes to permit, everybody by law is required, is required to apply for it before you can hold a public rally or a public event. But because for some reason, I don't know why the APRC never applied, I've never seen their permit, but I've issued two permits to Kemeseng. That one I can remember, I've issued him two permits. Thank you so much, Lema. This is very, very good information, and I think it is very important that uh, we understand this process. And it is, it is good to know that the time that you were there, that obviously the political parties, um, you know, the opposition uh, would apply, but uh, APRC, there was no need for them to apply. Suleiman, before I move on to my next question, I just wanted to ask you, during your tenure um, over in the um, service, can you share with the government people if you had seen any illegal activities or any type of um, tyranny or you know, any, any type of abuse that is directed to the government people that now that you understand what human rights is living in the UK, what can you share with us to show us that any, any, any type of abuse, uh, has any type of abuse happened under your watch or something that you know of, um, you know, either to oppress Gambian people or to somehow um, oppress on the um, opposition? The only experience I had was my first day at the police. I was taken around to serious crime and I saw this young man, he was in a Gambian, but he's a young lad, Why, whether he was a Gambian or not, uh, it was just not the right thing. I think he was suspected of theft. And then they had to tie his legs and hands, and then they put kind of a log in between the legs and hand and hang him between two desks. So when I saw it, I could not hold my reaction. I was really, really angry. And then when I commented, they said, oh, you just knew you get used to this. I said, look, this is not right. Whatever the case may be, you cannot get any information from this person. Whatever he tells you, he is telling you out of pain because he wants to get relief. So you cannot get any truth out of him. Let go of the man. So they let him go, they relieved him, and then I took charge of the case. And when I investigated it, unfortunately, that guy was completely innocent. The actual person that stole from the sub was the brother of the subkeeper. I said, here you go. So when I came over, I saw so many things. Then I started thinking that man could have sued the police and you know asked for damages because he was unlawfully arrested. He was physically tortured for a crime he has not committed. But just because he happened to be at the place at the wrong time and because he is a foreigner, so he's been taken as a victim when the actual culprit was there. And when we realized that was the actual person, the actual person who stole the goods from the shop, the brother never wanted to pursue it any further. So, so you're telling us that for a case of theft, you've seen somebody being tied um, you know, on a log and left dangling there, just a, another form of torture that's happening there, just for a simple crime of theft. Yes, that one I saw at the serious crime, at the time. Thank you so much, Suleiman, uh, again, for this vital um, information that you're sharing with us here. Suleiman, now that you've lived in the UK, uh, obviously for a while, you have a much better understanding of human rights and the role of an officer. It seems like you had a pretty good foundation, and I think that has to do with, obviously, your upbringing and understanding um, the, the whole fight that you did uh, in, in high school, in the demonstrations, your exposure to the uh, PDOIS. Can you take for a moment and just speak to that officer or a group of officers that are just graduating and just let them understand what their role is, why they need to act like, responsibly like you did when you were in the Gambia and the importance of doing it? Well, for, I've not been back home for several years and uh, to be quite honest, there was a point in time around 2007, 2008 when I wanted to go back. But I said again, if I had gone because of the exposure I had here, I would find it difficult to fit in. Because even at the time when I was go there, they used to call my colleagues and tell them, speak to Jeng, he's going with high speed. I don't know what they meant by that. 
So, so say that one more time. You said they said what? Uh, they would speak to my colleagues and say, speak to Jeng. He is going in high speed. We, I don't know which, what they meant by that, which high speed. But one thing I knew is like I was very close to the junior officers. And most of them, you know, were very fond of me because I had that open door policy where I didn't see myself like most of them were my age mate anyway, even though I seniored them by rank, but some of them seniored me in service and then we used to mix very well. So some of the senior officers didn't like that at the time because they saw it perhaps as a threat. I was rallying, you know, uh, these men and women around me, but that was just me. I'm a people's person. But to these officers, what I would say now is like, I understand most of them are graduates. So I expect an academic uh, would not, even if you're not an academic, any human being who reasons, you know, you would always want to treat someone else as you would want to be treated. And as a police officer, you're a public officer, you are expected to execute your responsibilities according to the uh, uh, constitution according to the uh, code of conduct according to the criminal code and everything so if you do that you would win the heart and minds of those whom you have uh, presided their cases over for example at the beginning a lot of people would say oh you know the police would always bookie cases that it's uh, literally they would accept bribes and then you know destroy the case but when i came in what i realized was happening actually was um, when they write their statements, their witness statements, when they prepare their cases, they prepare it in such a language that when they take it to courts, most of the magistrate would throw them out because they are poorly written, they're not pro properly prepared. And then other officers also uh, would feel actually insecure to go to uh, before a magistrate in a court to prosecute you know, uh, a suspect. Because mostly the, the magistrate will ridicule them. So as a result, some of these cases never pass beyond, you know, the OC's desk to go to court. So it wasn't actually, you know, the police officers were taking money to kind of kill cases. But because uh, at the time they didn't have, you know, the right know-how to, to do it. But now you have young educated Gambians joining the police. You have young lawyers joining the police. So I hope this time around, the police is going to be more professional in the way they execute their responsibility than it was before my time and after my time. Thank you so much, Suleiman. Uh, with that in-depth uh, explanation of uh, the whole, um, you know, uh, 2001 presidential campaign and bringing us to speed on the, um, how permits are applied and issued uh, in the Gambia there. And um, obviously, you know, some of the experiences that you've had, um, you know, or, or some of the things that you've seen. Now, um, I'm just going to switch over to uh, a, a quick current issue right now uh, about a gentleman, um, uh, Lieutenant Lamengano. Uh, this morning, I read on your newspaper, uh, the Kibaro, which uh, you are a uh, chief editor. Um, can you just tell us um, to the person that uh, have read um, about Lamengano doesn't quite um, get the story or you know get the um, you know um, the, the, the core of the story who is this guy and why have your paper written about him what is so controversial is he, he seems to be the newest thing on the in, in the news right now well, when, when, I, when I was in the place uh, my meetings with Ghana were mainly during uh, national parades uh, because when there is an independence uh, celebration or when 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 uh, there were these um, july 22nd anniversaries normally i would head the police platoon and Ba would head the piu platoon so we would be the uh, the commanders and then gano then was the pro of the army so normally it's like that was before we start the march pass and everything you know senior officers would meet we'll see that the officers mess and you know have conversation and talk but I wasn't that close to Ghana, but I knew he was, you know, a fine young officer. Like me, we were all young, we were coming up. And then later, I think he was an ADC to Jame. So he had that very close uh, relationship with Jame, very personal. So I want to believe he knows a lot about Jame that some of us don't know or would never know. 
So when I saw that he ha has a challenge, he gave Jamie a challenge. I said, wow, this is going to be interesting. I have to look into this. And then I, I brought the article up and then published it. He said he has written uh, 22 articles. And if Jamie did not take his um, challenge on board, then he would be left with no choice but to publish those 22 articles. I'm looking forward to reading those ones. I can't wait, definitely. I know for certain Jamie would never uh, take his challenge. That is, he wants Jamie to, uh, you know, uh, step down and not to contest for his 26th presidential election. And I doubt very much if Jamie would do that. So he said if Jamie doesn't, then he's going to uh, publish those 22 articles. And then we all looking forward to that. That is the main reason why I publish it, because I know uh, all the security services in the Gambia, the police, that's Interpol, uh, the NIA and the Army Intelligence Services, they will be reading the papers. So once they saw it and knowing Gano, the type of officer he was, they would be interested in what he is saying. So hopefully, uh, Jamie would also read about it and would take it if he is wise. But if he is not wise, then I hope Gano also would live up to his words and then publish those 22 articles he said he has written. Now, those 22 articles that he wrote, he, he, so he this is communication between him and the president or did he just write them and held them? Uh, I, don't, if he said, I, don't know. I don't know what those 22 articles are. Like I said, because of his personal relations with Jame as an ADC, I hope that most of the things he's going to write in those 22 articles would be very revealing. It would tell Gambians about Jame what we don't know about Jame. But if it is not that, then, well, a lot of us will be disappointed. Thank you so much, Suleiman, for that. Uh, one, uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, you're listening to the conversation here. Mouri Krubal is speaking with Suleiman Jeng. Very, very, very good information here. And this is the essence of exactly what we're trying to capture, just to have citizens come, come, you know, come on board and just talk to us, uh, give us insight on, 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 on how the nation ran before and how it is currently running and obviously the way forward. Um, Suleiman, thank you so much um, for, you know, obviously taking the time um, to come and join us here. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and switch over to, obviously, um, you know, the core of this conversation, which is more to do with the dictatorship in the Gambia. Suleiman, you have written a lot of articles uh, to describe describing our dilemma out there um, back home. What is your take on this dictatorship right now? Why do you think even after all these killings, the tortures, the abuse, yeah, it's still somewhat popular. And given that we have not seen any, I mean, there is no indication of when this is going to end. Why do you think after 21 years as a security officer, why, why this up? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, you're listening to the conversation. Mohoro Kubali here with uh, Suleiman Jang um, of the UK and also editor-in-chief of Kibaro Radio. Uh, Suleiman and I have been having a very good and informative conversation here. Suleiman, we'll go ahead and continue uh, this conversation. Um, like I said, uh, Suleiman, um, you're obviously, uh, you know, we, we're now going to talk about the core of this conversation, which is about the dictatorship in the Gambia. You have written a lot of articles describing our dilemma back home. What is your take on this dictatorship? Why do you think it has taken us this long, 21 years of abuse, and as a security, former security officer of that nation, what can you tell the Gambian people why this has taken so long for us to rise up and challenge this dictatorship? Well, one of the, the, the fundamental reasons is uh, most Gambians like to wait and see things happen before they start to partake. That is a malaise that most of us are suffering from. Uh, two, a lot of Gambians are more preoccupied with their own personal gain than that of the national uh, development. And also, uh, the dictatorship has 
kind of curtail has uh, suffocated Gambians from information so that they don't seem to know a lot of what is even happening in the country. Most of them would know what is happening in the Gambia from us outside the Gambia, which is uh, really sad. You did say Jame is popular. I don't think he is popular because when you say someone is popular, it means that person is loved. He is cherished by the people. But when you speak to ordinary Gambians, they will tell you, oh, we are tired of this man. Oh, he is this, oh, he is that. Just wait and see. He comes back to that same phrase, wait and see. He, he, he is not popular. I think he's just there because a lot of them uh, mentally and psychologically believe that uh, he's endowed with uh, extraordinary powers that if anyone makes an attempt to get rid of him, you know, that person would perish. Because that's the, the myth he has created in Gambian minds. For example, when you speak to anyone and start to talk about Jame on the phone, the person would say, oh, oh, don't talk about him here on the phone. I don't want to be in, in trouble. As if someone is listening to your conversation with that person. Often what I say to them is like, even in the West here, to tap a telephone is really expensive. So governments don't just waste taxpayers' money tapping any Tom, Dick, and Harry's telephone. You have to be an extreme threat to the state before they will start to eardrop on your phone or, you know, sniff around your emails or your conversation. So Jammeh, with all his wealth and the government's money put together, cannot sniff on every Gambian's conversation or eardrops on Gambian conversation. No, it's not possible. What they can do is maybe ask for Gamdel to give them a printout of uh, your phone conversation, like the people you've been calling and the time you spend talking to people. But he would never know what you've said to the person unless and until you tell him or tell the agent that this is what I had with X or Y. They would say, well, normal, naturally, it would. <laughs> when you have your itemized bill, you would know which numbers you've called, how long you spend on each conversation. But what you said is never recorded. But you know, and despite that, now we have all these uh, internet-based um, social media, you know, devices that you can use to call. So obviously, that those don't show on your phone bill, or Gamtel cannot track those anymore because if you use Viber, WhatsApp, or Facebook, they're gone. But it, it seems like still, we, 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 people are still scared. From a uh, you know security personal um, point. Um, was this designed, uh, when you were there, was this designed to just control the people, uh, scare them? Can you, you know, were you involved in anything like that, or do you know anything that was um, no, no, no. You know, a scheme put together? It was, it, it was never the case. You know, it's like some Gambians, like I often say, you know, uh, it's a lot of the Gambians that are helping Gambia stay because... They enabling him in a way. Sometimes they execute things in his name when he is not even aware of it. Until when it comes into the public, then he would know. Oh, this thing has happened when he wasn't even aware. For example, when I was at the mobile traffic unit, you know, you've got uh, this problem with uh, checkpoints everywhere in the Gambia. So some of those checkpoints, most also, almost ninety percent of them are all illegal police checkpoints because. They're not, it's only the mobile traffic office in Kanifing that has right to mount checkpoint anywhere in the country at any given time. And that is only temporal, either to check for lansings or improper or vehicles that are not registered or stolen vehicles. And then the other checkpoints, one that is legal is the one at the Yundum police station. Then you have the one at uh, Kalaji then you should have one uh, behind uh, between Basse and Belingara, and then you have one at uh, Koina and uh, Katong, because those are at the border point, so those require checkpoints to monitor people coming in and out. But all other checkpoints are just, you know, made to kind of get money from drivers or other people. So Malafi then, Malafi, uh, I think Jaju, he, he delayed Malafi, he was an inspector then, but he used to be attached to the uh, mobile traffic unit, but he was assigned at the state house as the officer responsible for vehicles, government vehicles in the state house. 
for example, when there is a campaign, normally you, because the the incumbent government uses the government vehicles, you know, to campaign. So Malawi used to organize all those vehicles and then assign each particular vehicle to a group or to a government officials who are part of the entourage. So that was his responsibility. Sometimes he would come and say, oh, H.E. said this. H.E. I said, look, Malafi, H.E. would never speak to you because he knows you've got senior officers. If he is going to effect any orders, he won't speak to you directly. He will speak to the IG, and that message would filter down to us. So don't come here telling us jack shit. So he knew I was not that officer that would take those instructions from a junior officer. So I would only take instructions from my senior officer, and they have to be genuine. So when he realized, then Walinyang was my boss. Walinyang was the uh, the OC at Kanifi. So Wali, of course, is a good officer, but he he panics very quickly. So he would want to take Malavi seriously. I said, no, don't don't listen to this man. If H.E. will speak, H.E. will speak to I.G. and I.G. will speak to you. H.E. will never send this man to come. So, you know, instances like that, people would just come and say, oh, Oga said you do this, oh, Oga said you do that, when Oga has not even said it. So if you comply, that becomes a precedent. So this is how some of these threats started to grow in the Gambia until they became, they become, you know, uh, precedents, they become laws, they become norms. So the NIA, I always used to have problem with them. For example, when they arrest people, you know, they do whatever they want to do. They prepare their case files and bring it to the police and say, okay, now we want you to prosecute these people. I said, no, I'm not going to prosecute the person. You investigated the crime. You effected arrest. You prepared your case file. Go, go to the court and prosecute. I'm not going to prosecute someone I have not investigated. So if other officers had stock up to that, then the NIA would have ceased arresting people or investigating them, preparing case files. Because it's not their responsibility. If it were their responsibility, they would have prosecuted those people. So some of these abnormalities, people accept them, and then eventually they become standards. So that's the problem with the Gambia. Nobody would want to question an order. Nobody would want to challenge something. Like Ibrahim Machonga, and when they came in, he stood and, and fought against them when all, all other senior officers ran. So, they have, you know, in any generation, there is someone that would just stand up and say no. If, you know, his likes were still there, you know, the police would have been a better force by now. Jamie would have gone by then. Because if he gives you an order and you say, <clears throat> look, sir, this is what you want, but it is not in accordance with the law. And if we do it, it's going to, you know, re react this way. And then the international community is going to see it in this way and that way. And you give him the, 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 the possibilities and then, you know, the reactions of what that action would lead to. And then he would, he would understand. But if he say, go and arrest Mr. Krubali, and I come and arrest you without even asking why should I arrest him. So the next minute he will say, go and torture this man and I will torture him. But if you, you know, reason with him, he will say, oh, no, no, this is not the guy I can mess with. So the only thing he could do is to ask you, okay, then you go, and then you go. If you feel you cannot walk like I, you leave. You go and look somewhere else. Thank you so much, Sleman, for that. Obviously, it, it, it has to do with standards and ethics, um, something that is lacking um, um, very much in, 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 in the armed forces today because, like you stated, um, obviously, most of this stuff, um, he probably, you know, there are orders that um, obviously are not coming um, from him, but people just um, trying to enable themselves and, uh, in a way, also uh, helping him uh, oppress us more. But, Suleiman, you have worked in the security uh, forces. Um, a lot of attempts have been um, done to get rid of this guy, and they have failed. Is it because his security is very good, or do you think it's within our own um, the problem is within our own that we're still not able to get to this guy. No, I think the problem is all uh, selfishness. Because the, 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 the case that Lang Tombong was accused of uh, that year, it was almost successful according to reliable sources. The coup was almost successful, but the person that was meant to be the leader, they said, no, he cannot lead because he is not seizing. He hasn't got the charisma of a leader. He cannot speak, you know, fluently. So there was that problem, leadership problem. 
And what happened? Lang Tombong had to back down and call the man and tell him, you can come back. Everything is fine. Even at that, they had to beg the man to come back. They, Lang Tombong has to call, go to his mom and speak to her, and they both have to call him to convince him to come back. So he was ushered in back into the country by the Mauritanian uh, paratroopers. But he said he was not coming back because he knew if he had come back, he would have been arrested. He didn't. So it's, it's not about him being secured. It's just about Gambian selfishness. And the, the last 30th December, if it were not the American that sold the boys uh, to the Senegalese government and then to Jame also, you know, it was almost a done deal. But because, you know, Savage, Solbaji and others realized that Jame already is in the know, so they had to back down and then say, okay, now, Oga, we cannot just stop these people because they're already here. We cannot get them. So what we have to do is we have to lay an ambush. Let them come in. We have to pretend that everything is still as it stands. And when those boys walked in, they walked into a trap. But if not, it would have been successful again. So it's like uh, the man is just lucky because we are not really organized. But if we are really organized, you know, to get rid of Jammeh will be very easy. Because getting to the state house is like sometimes you walked in as a senior officer, nobody would even decide you to say, oh, this and that and that. So if you are prepared, like at uh, this, uh, for example, I can give you a, a clear example. I cannot remember which year it was, but they had these two generators that were taken to go to power station. And then we had that close contact with the man. And if at that time I wanted to stab him with a knife or I had a gun that I wanted to shoot him, I could have done that instantly. There was no passing between me and him. And you have all the senior officers that had that access with the man. So if people wanted to get rid of him at the time, they could have. And even today, I believe those opportunities are still there. On one-to-one, -one you can get the man out. But it all depends on how organized we are and who is willing to take the risk. Thank you so much, Suleiman, to, 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 for, for that explanation. Obviously, for people to understand that this guy is not, does not have any supernatural powers. He's just a simple job that is so lucky, um, you know, uh, to, to, to stay in power for uh, the last 21 years. Now, so, uh, uh, Suleiman, speaking of disorganized, uh, let's switch for a quick second and uh, speak a little bit of um, politics here. Um, we have recently seen that the APRC has expected uh, nominated um, Yaya for a fifth term, and obviously the PDOIS um, has also uh, nominated um, Khalifa, which obviously we know CDL from my understanding is that he cannot run, and it's, it's always between the two of them. Um, in your take, and obviously as a senior uh, editor of a news, uh, very well-read newspaper, uh, Gambian um, newspaper online, what is you guys' take on these uh, nominations, and do you think, especially with the PDOIs, is it effective given that people are really looking forward to a coalition? To be quite honest, I'm, I'm absolutely devastated and disappointed uh, with the reaction, with the nomination of Khalifa as Doe's uh, presidential candidate. Jame, of course, we all know, you know, we were all expecting him to be nominated. But uh, when lawyer Dabo was here in the UK recently in Birmingham, I posed the same question to him. I said, what... Um, all of us in the diaspora, most of the panel discussions we had, it has resurfaced, not once, not twice, that everybody wants, every genuine Gambian wants the opposition to uh, come together and present one candidate, you know, to challenge President Jame in the 2016 uh, presidential election. That is the only hope that we have that Jame could be removed from power democratically. And then he said, well, he has an open mind, and he is willing to listen and talk. And I hope, you know, the other leaders also were willing and hoping to talk. And then I put that, I said, look, you are representing us, and if you want you to do something, we expect you to do it. You do it for our own sake. 
But if they refuse and then stand individually, they are only going to legitimize Jammeh. And like I said in my last article, it's like, come 2016 uh, pooling day, we either have to push the Gambia into a bottomless ditch or we have to take her to safer source by voting Jammeh out of office. But the way things are looking, uh, it does not appear in any way that the opposition would come together and present one single candidate. If the opposition doesn't come together, obviously we all know what's going to happen. But do you think there's even a slim chance chance that maybe the UDP can put up a good fight? And what do you think is going to happen with the UDP now that Davo cannot run? Do you, as the media, have any inside information as to what we should expect? UDP, I think, had that opportunity in 2001. A lot of Gambians, in fact, at the time, thought the UDP was going to win. Whether the ballots were stolen or not, but from my own observation, the turnout in their rallies were just magnificent. And a lot of people started even predicting long before pulling the that Dabo has won. And a lot of us got surprised why he didn't. And to this day, I didn't look back to investigate why he didn't win or not. But that was then, the opportunity was then. And now, with the way things are going, especially with him manipulating the electoral system, it would be absolutely difficult for UDP alone as a party to win the election. It would be absolutely unfathomable for Doi to win the election as a party against Jammeh, and neither the other parties. So their only chance is them coming together, rallying their supporters, and then voting against Jammeh. Because if you look at the electoral results in 2011, you know, all the opposition put their results together, obviously Jammeh would be nowhere. But because Jammeh would take half of the votes, and they would share the other half, so there's no chance they can win. And because a lot of people want them to come together, and if they don't, those people are going to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they're going to, you know, to hold back. You know, they would neither sponsor any party, they would neither partake in any party, and they wouldn't even uh, encourage their people to partake in the forthcoming election. So it's going to be just, you know, an easy ride for Jammeh. Do you think there's any hope that they, 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 you know, common sense might prevail for these people to, um, you know, forge a coalition, maybe at the 11th hour? Well, this, these people should be in the know already because they know what we want, especially in the diaspora. And, uh, excuse me, <coughs> I've, got, <coughs> I've got bad flu today. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. They already know what we want. It's, it's just a matter for them to come together and present one candidate. And then, you know, people will pump in money <coughs> from the West, some of us out here would sponsor the parties and would encourage people on the ground to go out and also vote. We've been campaigning, calling people, go and register. We've been writing, we've been talking, encouraging people to go and register. But if they register and then you still have these individual parties standing and people have different political affiliations, so it would be difficult to get Jammy out of office through the ballot. Indeed, indeed. Suleiman, thank you so much for that. Would you like to take a quick break and just um, uh, get, uh, seems like you need a sip of water or something? Yes, or you yes want... please. Thank you. Let's go yes. ahead and take a quick break, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, this is a conversation. Oli Kubal is speaking uh, with um, Mr. Suleiman Jang. Uh, we'll be right back. Thank you. 
kam na dal ko bo ni Ladies and gentlemen, once again, you're listening. To, you're listening to the conversation. This is Mamadou Kubali speaking with Suleiman. Suleiman, are you with us? Yeah, I'm with you. Thank you so much. I hope you did catch up on your birthday for a quick second. Seems like um, yeah, your cold is bothering you a little bit. But Suleiman, I promise we'll get you out of here in another ten minutes or so. Uh, we're just talking about the political situation in the ground. The opposition's failure to come together. Uh, something that is obviously very concerning to uh, a whole lot of us. Suleiman, obviously the 2016 elections will be here in December. The opposition, it doesn't seem like they will get their act together. As a security officer, where are we heading? And as a young Gambian, a member of the media, what needs to be done? I'm foreseeing a very, very bloody election because, <clears throat> for one, like UDP and the APRC already had a class at, uh, is it um, FAS? FAS, is it FAS Njagacho, isn't it? Yes. Where they had that uh, blockage. So, the, the UDP militants would still be nosing that grudge, and the APRC would still also see the UDP as <coughs> their, their tone in the flesh. And wherever they class, is not going to be smooth. And the, 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 the political, the, the security system now is such that, you know, the police has been reduced to another arm of the APRC. So they only execute orders in the interest of the APRC, not in the interest of any other political party. So the protection would not be given to other political uh, parties as it would be given to APRC. And that would expose these people's life more to danger. If the opposition, for example, UDP, is not given you know, uh, security, they've not been given uh, the PIU or the army or the police to protect them during their campaign, you could have these idiots coming in to sabotage their campaign, which could lead to a big clash where lives and properties would be lost. So the APRC militants could do a lot. So these are things that should have compelled the opposition parties to come together and then sort for all these things so that they can secure a good, and proper win against Jammy. What they are saying, even if Jammy loses the election, he's not going to go. That is just a story. That's a cock and bull story. If Jammy loses the vote, he will go. Nobody would ask him to pack his stuff and leave. He'll pack his stuff and leave. We've seen what happened to Bagbo. So Jammy would not want that to happen to him. 
If he loses the election, he will be thinking of his safest exit, where he could go and have a peace of mind. But he wouldn't want to say, oh, I've lost the election, but I'm going to stay. Nobody's going to take me out of this place. No, no, no. Jeremy would not even think of that, even in his wildest dream. So that is just a cock and bull story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suleiman, for that. Suleiman, let's assume for a second that the opposition UDP has hired you as a former security personnel. They're preparing to tour the nation, getting ready for the 2016 presidential election. I want you to advise them, security-wise, what they need to be careful of, how they need to handle the security threats out there. Well, one thing I would say is like... <clears throat> Uh, they should make sure that their, their youth wing uh, should make sure that their leaders are always protected and they should not at any point, you know, uh, let loose of their sight of their leaders because what would happen is like you never know Jeremy could send in any idiot to infiltrate them and do something stupid while uh, they are distracted. So... If they should be vigilant, then when Musa, uh, this uh, this boy Mane, uh, he was my junior at high school. I think he was also part of the UDP. But now I think he's a counselor in Brigham. I forgot the first name, but he's Mane, something Mane. He was my junior. I can't remember him very well. He was one of the the heads of the UDP wing during the uh, 2001 election. You need people like those ones who are determined, who are really vigilant, who would sacrifice their own lives for their leaders at least to protect the UDP leadership and make sure that, like they did, make sure they inform the international media and the, the diaspora uh, radios and newspapers. Because once we get this information and we put it out in the press, uh, the whole international community would know what is going on and that would give them added security. Because then Jammeh would know, oh, these people know, so they're watching now. The international community is watching and is listening. So if you do anything stupid, then there will be a problem. Because like <clears throat> that would it say, you know, the media is very powerful, which I concur with him. You know, it can, in the West here, like I said, it's the media that makes, you know, a PM win the election is the media that would make the PM lose the election. So the okay. same if we, the, you must have what you call a spin doctor that would help to propagate your political ideology and your campaign through the media for you to win the hearts and minds of the, the voters. So they need to liaise with the newspapers. They need to communicate with people. They need to inform us what is happening. And we also have to publish our news and stories accurately. We should not, for the, the sake of X or Y, you know, uh, print stories that are cook and bull. Whatever we are printing, printing must be accurate, must be factual. In as much as we have political affi uh, affiliation, like myself, I am a diehard Doi supporter, but when I write, I don't reflect my political lining. I try to reason out, to give, look at things from the outside perspective and point of view, and then give my own analysis. Sometimes my personal feelings, now and again I put it in, but most of the time I try to stand outside in my writings. Thank you so much, Suleiman. That was obviously a, um, an excellent discussion. I like the fact of um, you explaining to us what happened in the 2001 um, presidential election, the whole security apparatus, um, the whole permit um, seeking um, procedures, which is, um, this is the kind of information that we need to know, especially the young that have, um, you know, political um, ambitions uh, to understand the process. Uh, that is the core of this conversation, is just to bring um, young Gambians here, uh, people like you that, it, that can explain the process to us, but also very objective. You sound very objective, uh, very well directed, and uh, obviously that is uh, something that I think a lot of the um, young on the ground, especially the security forces, um, should be able to uh, can emulate uh, from. Thank you so much for coming to the conversation. I know that you're not feeling very well, but you still took the time to speak with us. 
Um, Suleiman, do you have any closing um, statements? Is there anything you would like to talk to the opposition, the government, the diaspora, and the Gambian people in general on the way forward? Well, to the Gambian people, what I would say is, like, the Gambia is ours, and no one else would come from outside and liberate it from. For us, we have to take ownership. We have to be responsible and liberate the country from the mantle of dictatorship. Well, um... The only way you can do that is by registering to vote and have your voter's card. And during election day, you have to vote for the party based on its policies, not based on its uh, patronage, like its leadership. For example, Jammeh or Dabo or Khalifa. If I am voting for any party, I would vote for it on the basis of its manifesto or its policies. And then also, <clears throat> I have to look at the leadership quality of the party, because uh, a party can have good manifesto, uh, good policies, but yet still its leadership is, is bad, is decayed, is corrupt. On that basis, I would also not vote for that party. For example, uh, the APRC, they might go and adopt excellent policies, but when it comes to implementing them, it would be something else. When their leadership you know, those not adhere to the rule of law. So such a party I would never vote for because I know it's the leadership that is the party. You cannot separate the two. But a party wherein you can separate the two, then you can vote for that party because then you know this party is operating under policies. If it le leadership is found wanting, the leader would go and make way for a new leader. But a party that has only one leadership for a life is something else. The diaspora and Gambians, we should not give up, you know, we should continue to fight. We should continue to speak to our people, we must continue to speak to the politicians until they reason. And then understand that Gambians want them to come together and put forward one candidate to contest against uh, Jammeh. Because if Jammeh has another five years, that means Gambia is just dead. Thank you very much for having me on the conversation. Thank you so much, Lema. And obviously, as um, the political season continues, we will be reaching out to you again to bring you in here, especially um, as you had predicted that um, you know there will be some serious classes. Uh, we would like to bring you back here as a uh, former security personnel and someone who understands Gambian politics very well to have a, um, a you know, conversation with us. Um, on the way forward, and of course, um, also help keep the um, people informed. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, um, that was uh, Mr. Suleiman Jeng of the UK, um, Editor-in-Chief of Kibaro Radio, and uh, we will definitely, um, once this is published on social media, Suleiman, we will have the opportunity to share it with you, and hopefully uh, you can share it with your listeners too. Uh, feel free to come to the conversation anytime you, uh, you wish. And uh, if you have anything important that you want to share with the people, I'm sure you have the per perfect medium for that. But this is also a different way of reaching the people, ensuring that we talk. The goal here is that we carry on these conversations to hopefully make the process a lot easier so that when we find ourselves at that table where we're discussing national matters, the process will be a lot easier. Thank you so much. And greetings thank from Los Angeles. So well, we, we also need to thank you, Mr. Krupali. And uh, like you said, uh, <clears throat> even though it's not a personal thing that we talk here, but it's like you come from a family that has always contributed towards the development of its community. Your dad was an MP, and uh, we've all seen what he has done for our community. And then you standing up now fighting for that country, you know, to people who know you and who know your family, it's not, you know, a surprising thing. This is thing that you are continuing to do because this is a situation in which you were born and grew up. So thank you so much for what you're doing for the Gambia. Thank you. It's a responsibility, and I'm, um, I feel obligated that uh, my personal feeling is that no matter how successful I am as an individual or a family, um, if the Gambian people are not free, um, we're all still not free. And at the end, until our nation is free, the fight continues. Thank you so much. Thank you, and bye-bye.